families for being here. I tell you, I, I just love family time. I've learned, I'm not trying to get all sentimental over here, but, um, but since I've had my little one, he's college age, you may have to talk about this. But since I had my little one, uh, about in the two of January, I realized, listen, there is nothing no better than family time. Amen. Even if it's just sitting, listen, I, me and my wife, we didn't sit around the table much when we were, uh, when we first got married, we would, you know, go on the road and we'd get, you know, fast food and all this kind of stuff, but I've learned here recently, man, we, we sat around the table a little bit more and talked a little bit, even though he jabbers and we don't have a clue what he says. We jabber right back at him, we don't have a clue what we say sometimes. But I thank God for families. I thank God for you bringing your family here. No better place to be than bring the person you love to a place that God loves them. To help show them that, listen, I, I tell you, when you have a wedding, you invite all of you that you love. Because 40 bucks a person for a dinner, you're going to make sure you love them if you don't have to go to your wedding. And listen, you should be honored and thankful that somebody asked you to come to a place that they love to come. And I thank you so much for being here. At this time, we'll turn over Brother Coulter. As I said, he's our state overseer here in South Carolina. Um, I think this is your four and a half, four and a half. Wow, I was up there. Four and a half. And um, four and a half years here in South Carolina. And uh, I know him and his wife. I thank God for them. They've helped, like, as, I, as I said earlier, they helped me and Sister Sherry out a lot. And I'm going to turn it over to him. It is said that folks determine within the first few minutes when they come to a church if they want to return. Amen. I can tell you that for my wife and I, we made that decision before this church ever started. <laughs> we pulled into the uh, the parking lot. Everything looks so good. You've been working, haven't you? Uh, grounds look wonderful. And last time I was here, I got a tour of the children's worship area. I know about the place across the road. I've actually eaten over there. I look forward to doing that again today. And then when we came through the doors, there was a greeting team of mostly young people. And young people, I just want to brag on you just a moment. You didn't give me one of those fish handshakes. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? But you gave me a firm handshake, looked me square in the eye, and gave me a big smile. That says a lot about you young people. Kids were giving me high fives. And then somebody opened the door back here, and all those who weren't kids and youth started flooding the sanctuary. And I enjoyed a lot more hugs than handshakes. This is a friendly, friendly church. And if uh, Kelly and I were living in this area and we're looking for a church home, I've got a notion we would give strong consideration to making this our place of worship. So thank you so much for the warmth, the welcome. Kelly told me just a few moments ago, she said, you know, it just feels good in here. That has nothing to do with the padded pews, has nothing to do with the temperature of the air. It just feels good. Aren't you glad you have a good church to come to? Now, I understand that stuff like this doesn't just happen. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Not just pastoral leadership, but church leadership. And uh, I, I just want to commend you as a church for all that you have done. I'd like to give honor to your former pastor. So good to have you right here on the second row. You're going to be my amen corner this morning. Brother and Sister James, uh, they have blessed Kelly and I so much, just seeing their smiling faces and their, their support and their love, their love for you. And then to, uh, to witness firsthand this pastoral transition that took place to Pastor Winburn and his lovely wife, um, it couldn't have been better. And I understand that you are doing a month of honor. Uh, I was told that last Sunday you had this place uh, filled with civic leaders, uh, fire and rescue and police and council men and women. Uh, thank you for honoring this community. But I would like for us to take just a moment to honor your pastor. And I, I know that you do this frequently, but could I ask the two of you just to come and stand right here for just a moment? There are some things about these two that I wish that I could clone. 
and deposit in every pastor in this state. And that has to do with passion. You can, you can help individuals learn new skills, but passion is something that has to come from inside. And God has placed passion in them for this church, for you, for this community. I love your, uh, uh, your I don't know if you call it a vision statement or mission statement, where you are spirit-led, Christ-centered, community-minded. Now, I'll tell you, I really don't remember with 118 churches in this state, I don't remember too many of their taglines like that. But I haven't gotten this one out of my head. I like that. I wish I had thought, thought that up myself. Because it says everything about us. Being spirit-led means that we are a Pentecostal body. Being Christ-centered is what it's all about. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. And then being community-minded, that he's not just pastoring this church, he's pastoring this community. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to stand at your feet for just a moment. Now we're going to do two things simultaneously. One, now we can do that, right? We're all coordinated. We can do two things at the same time. One thing, I want us to give, in just a moment, I want us to give your pastoral family a standing ovation, not just for a second, but I want it to be a lingering hand of appreciation and love. Not just a, a mindless gesture, but if you really love these folks, I want you to express it that way. Now, here's the second thing. While we are clapping, I'm going to ask about ten of you, the first ten to come and give these two one of the biggest bear hugs that you've got. And I just want you to verbalize how much you love and appreciate them on behalf of everybody in this church. So we're not going to ask everybody to come, just the first ten or so, but while they're coming, we're all going to do what? We are going to give them a hand, a clapping, standing up. Brother and Sister James, I trust this church will continue 
honoring and celebrating you. And take the next month to honor the ministry of this church. Would you do that? I've got a notion that you will. Thank the Lord. Honoring family. You know, it's, uh, it's mentioned in the Bible that we're to do that. In fact, if you go back to the Ten Commandments, there's one particular commandment that says, Honor thy father and mother. Now, the commandments aren't placed in just any random order. I believe that there is a particular sequence to the commandments. The first four go like this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any raven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Those are the first four. And then it gets to this one. Honor thy father and mother. You see, honor flows from a life that first honors God. Amen. That's how we best honor our family is when we are first honoring God. And so you get to this commandment, honor thy father and mother, and then you have these subsequent commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. You see, honoring in the family is the cornerstone for decency and morality in our citizenship. So we honor our family as we first honor God, and then we live decently and in order as we honor our family. It all flows from one to the other. So the Bible is full of honor. The Bible tells children to honor their parents, and in doing so, you will have long life. It tells husbands to honor your wives as the weaker vessel. Listen, that your prayers be not hindered. Did you see the, the spiritual connection there? Amen. That the way our home goes impacts our spiritual relationship. If we're fussing and fuming and fighting at home, it's hard to come and shout the victory at church. Amen. So there's, there's this element of honor that we're going to be talking about today. Don't you love families? Here's what's going to happen this morning. I believe that when you leave this service, we are going to eat even more than we do now. We are going to esteem the home, family. I hope that you'll be so excited about your home that when you leave here, you're going to have a family powwow and just honor each other. Amen. Just give each other a, a big hug and respect and love and enjoy the time that you have with your family. You know, it isn't often in our society that we hear positives about the family. Preachers often prepare sermons rehearsing the demise of the family. They'll give you all the statistics telling you how bad it's getting. Writers publish books about the war against the family. Prayer requests are often given expressing concern for trouble in the home. Conversations among friends often reveal struggles within the family. With rare exception, such as maybe a landmark anniversary, do folks seem to publicly celebrate the family. But it's so important that that voice is heard from the church. Amen. That we're not hopeless on the family. Amen. We're not just speaking of, of its struggle in our society and the demise of the home. Somebody needs to lift up a voice of hope and celebration for the family. And that voice must come from the church. Amen. You know, when kids are young, start off to school, most often, kids think school lunches are absolutely wonderful. <laughs> you know, you get to go, do you remember doing that? You get to go through the line, you get your own little tray, and, and you get this carton of milk, and if, if you're really living out on the hog, you get two cartons of milk. <laughs> and, and, I mean, there's this independence when you're a little child, first going to school, and you get to go to the lunch line, and you think it's just great, until you hear other kids talking about how bad school lunches are. They talk about the cafeteria food and make jokes about the mystery meat. 
which perhaps it is. <laughs> and somehow, with all of the negative talk, school lunches begin to lose their luster. Do you realize that all of us are people of influence? What we say and how we say it leaves an impression. Kids need to know that not every marriage is falling apart. Not every home is a war zone. Not every family is in trouble and not every day is a struggle. They need to hear a positive message about marriage and the family. Girls need to hear from other women how wonderful it is to be a wife and a mother. And boys need to hear men who are happy being a one-woman man, guys who think that being a, a father and a husband is the greatest calling in the world. That's what we need to be proclaiming because what we say among all these kids that just slipped out of the sanctuary, what they hear from us in our homes, in our churches, how we talk about our families, will influence them. Let's give them something to look forward to. The Bible is a book that champions a family. From the very first chapter in Genesis, we're told that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. God had a great idea when he ordained the family. Solomon said in Proverbs, Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. If you happen to be sitting next to your wife, would you just look at her and say, You are a good thing. Boy, that didn't go well. Either that or you're not sitting next to your wife. And don't say it if that's not the person next to you. But I would come and tell my wife, you are a good thing. We just celebrated 34 years of marriage, and I would do it all over again. I found a good thing. That's not just all that that verse says. It says, whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Amen. That's how good the family is. Psalms chapter 127 says, Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. They're not a mistake. They're not an intrusion. They're not a financial liability. Children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Mine's getting fuller every day. We started out with three children of our own. They all got married, so that multiplied to six. Because our, our son-in-laws and daughter-in-law are now our children. And when you know it, they have taken on the first chapter of Genesis about multiplying and replenishing the earth. And over the last six years, we now have six grandchildren. And one more is on the way. The number of perfection is coming. My quiver is fuller than it has ever been. But they are a great reward. And then when these children rise up, Proverbs 31 says that the children rise up and call mama blessed. And her husband also. And praise him for it. Ephesians 5 speaks of a husband loving his wife just like Christ loved the church and gave himself. Peter talks about the husband honoring the wife and being heirs together of the grace of life. Listen, this Bible is, is, is filled with family. So it's going to be hard to have a proper relationship with God if we discard the family. Because it's all through the book. Now, I'm going to take you to a passage in Jeremiah chapter 18. This isn't your typical family passage. But I'm going to draw some principles today from this. Jeremiah 18, beginning with verse 1. You know this passage well. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. Everybody knows what a potter is, right? A, a, a 
Have you ever seen them do that? Maybe you went to Gatlinburg and you went to Dollywood and saw them doing something like that where they have this potter's wheel and there's some clay and it's, it's all wet and hand that he's peddling this and it's turning round and round and he's shaping the clay. This is the image that we have in this passage. He said, I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I, not, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hands. I want to suggest to you this morning that the house, your home, is the potter's studio. You see, God's intention for our life, listen carefully, God's intention for our life isn't necessarily to make us happy. It's to make us holy. Amen. Now, happiness comes along. I do believe that we should be happy Christians. But God's ultimate purpose for us isn't to make us happy, it's to make us holy. What does holiness mean? It means to be shaped into the image of God, into His character, into His likeness. No place does that happen better than in the home. Amen. Think about it. The home has a way of, of sanctifying us. It has a way of putting us on the potter's wheel and rubbing out those rough areas of our life so that, as it says in Galatians 4, that Christ can be formed in you. There's no better place for that to happen than the home. At home, we're at work on the potter's wheel. It is there that God grooms for each of us certain Christian virtues. Let me give you just a couple for example. What about the virtue of selflessness? Paul framed this particular virtue like this in Philippians 2. He said, let not every man look on his own things, but on the things of others also. Now, do you remember when you were, how many of you are still single? You're not married. Don't, you know, lift them up. That's good. And if you need help with that, my wife is a wonderful matchmaker. <laughs> if God's called you to singleness, praise the Lord. That's great. How many of you are married? Let me see your hand. Good. We have a good balance here. Do you remember, those of you that are married, do you remember what it was like being single? You could... I got one amen. <laughs> You could eat where you wanted to eat. You could do with your time what you wanted to do with your time. You could spend your money as you wanted to. You could keep your little room or your house or wherever you were just like you wanted and leave stuff everywhere you wanted. I mean, you were your own person. Then you stood before a minister and you said two words that changed your life. I do. And boy, did you. <laughs> Things changed drastically. Being a part of a family now influences every decision you make. Now you have to consult with somebody else. Where are we going to eat? What car should we drive? You, you want to watch what television show? How did you spend that money? Where are we going on vacation? Matters of the daily schedule. You are not your own man or your own woman anymore. You have joined with someone else. And you said, I do, and that implied a whole lot of doing. But listen. When you consider the needs and desires of your companion above your own interest, when you faithfully give your time and attention to a sick family member, when you sacrifice financially something you want to provide for your children, when you make arrangements to care for aging parents, 
It is then that you were most like Jesus, who made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. It is in the home that we are shaped on the potter's wheel. We are groomed. He, he brings, he develops this character of selflessness into our lives. Three times out of the four Gospels, Christ said, If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. The home is the studio. It is the classroom where selflessness is best learned. It's there that we take on the image of Christ. It's not always easy, is it? We live in a world that sort of has the Sinatra theme. I did it my way. But there's something beautiful that happens when we lay aside our will and our way and we live a life of selflessness. And that, that is... That is demonstrated mostly in the home. Another, another character that we develop in the home is, is humility. Paul, in describing Christ in Philippians 2, says he humbled himself. I don't know of a more humbling environment than the home. Home is where busy executives wash dishes. Where beauty queens clean the toilets. Home is where public figures take out the trash and all-star student athletes have to make their own beds. You see, title, position, reputation, prestige, popularity, all of those things get checked at the door of your home. <laughs> when George W. Bush was president, his wife, Laura Bush, told the story that they had an overnight visit to George's mom and dad, who had also been president of the United States. And as was his normal practice, President Bush gets up about 6 in the morning. He went downstairs to get a cup of coffee at his mom and dad's house. He got the cup of coffee, sat back in the chair, and put his feet up on the table. His mama came down and saw where his feet were, and she said, George, get your feet off the table. And the dad said, Barbara, he's the president of the United States. She said, I don't care who he is, his feet are on my table, and I don't want them there. It was Solomon who said, before honor is humility. It doesn't really matter who you are inside your own home. God has a way of shaping us in humility. Home reveals not only the best of times, it reveals the worst of times. It is at home when you, when people see you there that other people out in public wouldn't see you quite like this. With your morning breath, your wake-up hairdo, the sounds and sights of sickness, it is here that we become vulnerable enough to reveal our imperfections, our fears, our inadequacies, our faults, our failures, our blemishes. It's in the home that we learn humility. Have you had those experiences? Man, I have. Can I tell you, at home, she could care less if I'm the overseer of South Carolina. At home, we learn humility. Just a few years ago when our kids were younger, my, my middle daughter was a teenager. And we happened to be the only two at the house at the time. And I was doing one of those husbandly things. I was drying some dishes, washing and drying. And I had this big Coke glass. It's, it's a guy's kind of glass where you can put the whole gallon in at one time just about. And then I had my hand down inside. I was going to dry it out real good on the inside, and when I did, the glass broke and sliced through my hand. And it was, it was bleeding. I didn't realize just how much it was bleeding. I got a towel and wrapped it around quickly, and in just a matter of, of a minute or two, the towel was completely soaked in blood. So I thought, okay, something's got to give here. And, and, and can I just tell you, I wasn't really dressed to go anywhere when this happened. Have you ever tried to get dressed with one hand? 
This is the predicament I was in. Just, just to be quite honest with you, I couldn't figure out how to, how to fasten my britches. I had to call my daughter into the room and ask for her help in fastening my pants. Getting them pulled up right. Can you? Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but I'm a private kind of guy. There are some things I just soon to take care of myself. But this time, I couldn't do it myself. And so, I had to ask my daughter, it was humiliating, to say, come and would you mind to just get my britches right, my pants, and hook them up just right. After that episode, she was on the phone with mom, and she said, oh mom, I had to do the, the most humiliating thing today. I had to fasten dad's pants. <laughs> it's in the home that those kind of things happen. It's through these everyday life experiences that the virtue of Christ is formed in us. It's in the home that we are at work on the wheel. Can I tell you, it's also in the home that our brokenness is revealed. Jeremiah went on to say, He wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. I just asked you a moment ago to turn and tell your wife you're a good thing. Now, I know, I know you're not sitting by your companion, so this one doesn't matter. Just tell whoever's sitting next to you. Tell them, do you know that you're marred? <laughs> Now, a couple of you here probably said, not me, buddy. Oh, yes, you are. We all have our flaws. Now, now here's the deal. When, when a vase is dropped and the pieces are glued back together, my wife is a master of fixing stuff. When things are glued back together from a distance, it may appear flawless. But upon closer examination, when you get up close to it, the chips and the cracks are easily seen. You see, in relationships where people get up close and personal to you, it's then that we hear this term, familiarity breeds contempt. In other words, the closer you are to somebody, when you really see all the details of who they are, you see all their faults and blemishes and all that kind of stuff, and, and you realize they're not necessarily just as pristine as you thought they were from a distance. I'm not talking about moral matters. I'm talking about just who we are as people. People who appear flawless from a distance have noticeable cracks and chips when viewed up close. We all have our imperfections. And nobody knows that better than our families. Now, this is, I think, one of the really neat things about family. You see, there, there are certain people that you like because of. They have certain personality traits or qualities that appeal to you. They're, you like them because of, I like, I, I like them because they drive a neat car. I like them because of the way they treat me. I like, I like them because we just have great conversation together. We like certain people because of, but that's not so for the family. For the family, we love them sometimes in spite of, think about it, in spite of all the dirty diapers, don't you love your babies? In spite of the terrible twos, I like what some call, they call it the terrific twos, it's all a matter of perspective. You love those toddlers. In spite of the adolescent clumsiness, don't you love them? In spite of those teenage attitudes, yeah, I went through those times when my kids thought I was Superman. I was, I was who's who. And then I went from that to who's that. <laughs> it, it's amazing. But even during those teenage years, when they really have those attitudes, you don't stop loving them. You don't love them because of them. You love them sometimes in spite of them. And for the benefit of our, our teenagers, don't you really love your parents? Even though they can be overprotective, demanding, totally uncool at times, and often embarrassing. But you love them. Even when your companion is grumpy, stressed, domestically challenged, even when they over, 
overwrite the checkbook or lose the car keys or even catch the house on fire. And I can tell you a story about that one in our home. You still love. You still love. Hey, nobody's perfect. Not even me. Not even me. And nobody knows that better than the potter. It's a home that he's shaping us in selflessness and shaping us in humility. It's in our home that he reveals our brokenness. But it's okay because home, we can still be loved. And finally, home is the place where we can be secure. Wow. One of, the, one of the tragedies of our society today is we have disposable families. That wasn't God's intent. That when things are, are just going well, we're together, when we, when we decide to make a new turn, we, just, we can do it frivolously. That wasn't God's intent. But listen. Jeremiah's passage says, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Can I tell you, marred vessels never leave the potter's hand. He doesn't trash them. He doesn't throw it away and say, well, I'll just give me a new one and I'll start again. He takes what's marred and he makes it another vessel as seems good to the potter to make it. Home is that kind of place. It's a place of Security, a place of grace. There's an amazing story in the book of Hosea. It's an Old Testament book. God told this man, it's the only time in Scripture that we see anything like it. God told this man, a Christian man, a righteous man, to go marry a harlot. He was going to demonstrate a spiritual truth through this arrangement. And so, Hosea obeyed the Lord. He went and married the harlot. Her name was Gomer. Now, I know when you think of Gomer, you think of pot. But this was a, a lady who was an adulteress. Through her, they had three children, a girl and two boys. But this harlotry wasn't out of her system. She went back into that lifestyle. And she lived in such a way that she lost everything and was put on the, more or less on the auction block. And she was to be sold. And God instructed Hosea, I want you to go and buy her back. Wow. I'm not sure I can do that. If I had made an investment in my life and another person like that, and they had gone back into life of adultery and harlotry, for God to say, I want you to bring her back, buy her again. He was demonstrating his love for his people, Israel. And he said, they have been a harlot nation. They have committed spiritual adultery. But it speaks volumes about the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ Amen. who buys back, Amen. who keeps us in the potter's hand. He doesn't discard. He doesn't cast away. He keeps it. You see, it's in the home that, that we need that redemptive quality where we all at times need forgiven. Not for sins, not for adulteries. I'm not encouraging us to go out and live that life at all, but there are things daily that we just need to be forgiven on where we don't need grudge as hell. There's this principle of Scripture that that should be lived out of all places in the home. In the home. Where we are secure in the home. Regardless of our past, regardless of our failures, regardless of our troubles, that the home is a place of security. Listen, I have heard folks, church folks at times, Talk about how that, that their, their children or their grandchildren turned from God and so they just sort of kicked them out and said, we're going to keep our house holy and we're not going to have any of that going on here. And if that's the way you're going to be, it's not going to happen here. What a message we see in the story of the prodigal son. Where the dad didn't, he couldn't stop it his son from going into the far country. He was determined to go. But I can just envision his dad every day going out to the fence, seeing if he's coming home. 
And when he finally came to his senses, the son went to the pig pen. He got as low as he could go. He had gone as far as he could go. He was eating with the pigs. He was battling them for the food. And he said, why don't I just go home? Maybe my dad will take me back as a slave, as a hired servant. But when he got there, the Bible says that his dad embraced him and kissed him and said, let's have a party because our son that was lost is found. That's the kind of home that God wants to cultivate in all of us. It's a safe place, a place of refuge, that when your kids or your companion has gone out and blown it somehow, that home can be a safety net. Amen. That's why we honor the home today. It's where, where God is demonstrated most beautifully. He places us on the potter's wheel. He shapes us into character. He, he mends our brokenness, and it's a place of security. You know, when my kids, and then they went through times when it was a real struggle. Some of my children did some things I'm not proud of. And there were times that, you know, you know how it is when you're proud of your kids. There are times that I'd be so proud of them and then it was like a roller coaster. I'd mean, be so frustrated, so disappointed. You know, we bought them out and then here we go up again. Be down again. It was at times it was like a roller coaster. But can I tell you that through all of those times, love is not to be on the roller coaster. Love is constant. Amen. Love is constant. That's the love God has for us. And that's why home is such a beautiful picture of Christ. So today we honor the home, and in doing so, you can't honor the home without honoring Christ because they're so integrated one with the other. Aren't you glad you have a home? Now you might say, preacher. Sounds wonderful, but you don't know where I came from. You don't know my home. No, I don't know your home. Perhaps you came from a home that, that was abusive. Maybe you came from a, a home where there was abandonment. That is such a beautiful picture there that we have of a church family. We're in a church family. All of these same attributes that we see in the home can happen here. Where God puts you on the potter's wheel and, and he sort of shapes you right here in church, among church folks. He'll shape safe selflessness and humility right here among our church family. He will, he will take your marred qualities and he'll groom you into the image of Christ. And he'll remind you that regardless of how far you go, he loves you still. That's what the church family is. So today we celebrate family. We honor family. I'm going to ask you to do something today. Now, would you stand with me for just a moment? If your family is here, your husband, your wife, your children, maybe your extended family, I'd like for you to get with them. It's sort of a holy hub. Join hands together. Get in circles. It, maybe it's all over the world. If your family is not here, and you know folks who are here today whose family's not here, would you adopt them into your family and put them in your circle? Just want you to get with your families real quick. Today we're celebrating family. We are honoring. I'm a dog. 